Hello and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app or want to try a project you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so take a look at our friends over at Linode. With 200 gigabit private networking, scalable shared block storage, node balancers, and a 40 gigabit public network, all controlled by a brand new API, you've got everything you need to scale up. And for your tasks that need fast computation, such as training machine learning models, they just launched dedicated CPU instances. And they also have a new object storage service to make storing data for your apps even easier. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash Linode, that's L-I-N-O-D-E today, to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. And you listen to this show to learn and stay up to date with the ways that Python is being used, including the latest in machine learning and data analysis. For even more opportunities to meet, listen, and learn from your peers, you don't want to miss out on this year's conference season. We have partnered with organizations such as O'Reilly Media, Corinium Global Intelligence, ODSC, and Data Council. Upcoming events include the Software Architecture Conference, the Strata Data Conference, and PyCon US. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash conferences to learn more about these and other events and take advantage of our partner discounts to save money when you register today. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Arik Framovich about Redash, an open source business intelligence platform that helps you make sense of your data. So Arik, can you start by introducing yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Arik. I created Redash. I'm a software engineer that happened to become a CEO of a small SaaS company. I still try to code, so I guess I'm still a software engineer more than a CEO. And do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Yes, yeah, so I've been thinking about that question, and I realized that was when Google App Engine was released. So I guess that's when I picked up Python, so that's 2008. Can you start by describing a bit about what the Redash product is and some of its origin story and why you started building it in the first place? Sure. So Redash is basically, like, you can call it a BI tool, but... In simple terms, it's a web interface that you can use to connect to your databases or actually data sources because we support more than just databases like Google Spreadsheets, Jira, Salesforce, or any JSON API. Then once you connect it, you can query those sources and visualize the results in different forms like charts, maps, whatever, or just a plain table is fine as well. Group that in a dashboard and share within your team or company organization. So Redash was born actually as a hackathon project a bit over six years ago at the at the, at the previous company I was working at, Everything Me. We we were just starting to use Redshift and we needed a tool to share the data from Redshift. And we didn't find anything at the time that would work well with with Redshift, and we had a hackathon. So at that hackathon, I created the first iteration of Redash, um, and that's how it started. That's funny that it started as just sort of an accident, and now it's become your main source of revenue. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, it's not like I have any BI background or anything. I basically stumbled into it, and I happen to really like the field. I really enjoy like the, the product and i really like enjoy seeing things that are where they're like people use it for like extra stuff it's not like a game it's like driving their business um, so it's really fun and so in the context of the hackathon i guess how long did you have to work on it and what did the end result look like by the time that you were done with the hackathon and what was your decision point where you thought that okay this is something that i can actually make a business out of or something that i can keep hacking on you know what, what was the story beyond just that point and uh how did it lead you to where you are now? The hackathon proved that, yeah, we, we can build something that will be useful for us. And then I kept working on it as a sort of 20% project at the company. About, I think, two months after the hackathon, we open sourced it. And that's when we started seeing adoption from other companies. It, it's been slow at, at, at first, but then it, it became like we saw more and more adoption and around something like two years into the project, everything me was shut down. It was a startup and like they didn't find a business model and it was shut down. And at this time, I saw enough adoption of Redash by real companies that use it for their daily stuff that I figured there is a good opportunity here. So I wanted to make sure that Redash has a sustainable future and that's how I decided to start the company. So in terms of the product itself, what are some of the primary ways that it's used given that it, you're able to use it for gaining access to all these different data sources and build dashboards and visualizations around them? 
yeah, so I hope that all these things by Windows are not in the recording. So the main use cases are, guess, I guess, are BI and anal analytics. And by analytics, it's both like usage analytics of different products, but also operational analytics, like understanding the business, understanding how, like, I don't know, like from like my personal experience, what we are using Redish internally at Redish for, we like analyzing our revenues. So we use Redish for that. We basically have our charges table and we put Redish on top and build different dashboards that show our revenues and churn and stuff like that. Because it connects to so many data sources, the usage is very diverse. Some people use, I guess that the main usage is business users, but there are some people that using it for operations proper, um, just to analyze their infrastructure. I think that's not a great use of Redash. There are better tools for that, but it has the benefit that you have all your sources in one place. And in terms of the business intelligence market, there are a number of products that have been available for a while, both commercial and open source, and they've gone through their own evolutions over the years. But I'm curious how you view Redash in the context of the business intelligence market in particular, and what are the elements of the Redash product specifically that have allowed it to be successful given the maturity of the market and the number of competitors that there are? Yeah, the, the, the market is very, like, there are so many solutions. But I think that what helped Redash is a combination of two things. One is the fact that it's very easy to start with. I mean, you, you deploy Redash and you can either, like, use our SaaS and that takes a few minutes, or you can use one of the cloud images we provide and that also takes a few minutes to start. And once you have Redash ready, um, you can connect it to your database and you can have dashboards ready to share with your team in an hour or even less sometimes more it really depends on the kind of questions you're trying to answer so the fact that it's so easy to use is one um, aspect that helped the other thing is the the fact that we support so many data sources and especially that we were early on to support things like redshift bigquery and amazon athena where they didn't have that many support from more traditional tools that really helped with adoption i think that especially BigQuery. It's a, I, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but it's like the developer evangelist for BigQuery used to use Redash for his demos. So that's definitely helped with people getting to know the project. Yeah, in terms of the competitors that I view as being closest to Redash, they're things like Metabase and Apache Superset, which are good projects in their own right. But you're right in that Redash definitely has the edge in terms of the number of data sources that are supported. And that's actually a big reason of why I started using it in the first place, particularly for things like Elasticsearch that weren't supported at a number of other projects. So that's definitely one thing that continues to be the case. And I'm curious sort of what your approach was in terms of being able to enable connections to so many different data sources as far as how the plugin interface was defined or what's involved in adding data sources to Redash that has allowed you to maintain that velocity as you continually add new data sources with each release. I think it's based on the fact that to add a new data source in Redash, there is a very, very simple API you need to implement. You basically need to implement how to execute a query. And then you can add support for implementing how to get the schema of the da database that you're querying, but that's optional. Um, so it's basically two things that you need to implement. It's quite simple most of the time. Sometimes with things like Elasticsearch, it's actually not that simple because then we, we work with the table concept of results. So you need to like mesh the data set that comes back if it's nested and stuff like that. But usually it's not, not really that complex. And I think this model and the fact that we don't have our own query language. Whenever you use Redish, whatever you use it with, that's the query language you will use. Um, I think that really helps us being able to add almost any data source very fast and very easy. So I guess that that's the thing. Yeah, the fact that you're using the native syntax is definitely beneficial as far as anybody who's familiar with that data source can pick up Redash and start being effective without having to learn the specific peculiarities of whatever interface is being exposed in the other tools. And a lot of other older business intelligence suites will actually use more of a drag and drop editor for being able to define queries and answer questions. And so I think the fact that you're relying on just the native interface helps 
particularly in this day and age where people are more likely to want to use the code interface than anything else, at least from a developer perspective. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the trigger for me to like look into developing Redish was trying to use Tableau. And Tableau have this really rich interface and all drag and drop. But when we connected it with Redshift, it was so, so slow. I mean, the queries it was generating were very not performant. Um, it was really bad experience. I mean, it looked all shiny and nice, but when you try to create something, it was a really terrible experience. So yeah, just having a SQL box that I can type in my query was super helpful. And you mentioned that you didn't really have much of a background in business intelligence before you get started on this project. And so I'm curious, what are some of the most notable lessons that you've learned about that landscape and about the market since you first started the project and some of the ways that the learning has reflected in the Redash product? I'm not sure I learned that much about BI. Um, I'm just trying to build a product based on our customers' feedback. But something that I did realize at some point is that all the big tools promise self-service BI. Basically, the idea that the business users can ask questions themselves, but in practice, almost nobody really delivers it. Um, Looker are quite close to that, but it requires a huge effort to set up. And if the organization doesn't invest that effort, they won't get self-service. And I, early on, decided that we are not going to promise self-service BI. Uh, we are not going to have a drag and drop interface. Uh, we're just going to let you use your database. It's probably going to change at some point. Like we, like I have a, a certain roadmap in, in my head. And I think that at some point we will be ready to introduce a concept of drag and drop. But I'm pretty sure we will do it differently from how it's usually done. Because usually um, they, they try to stitch a drag and drop interface to a really bad schema. And that doesn't allow you to ask the interesting questions. Um, that's when people go back to writing SQL. Um, so that's why we want to give a really great SQL experience and then add on top of that. And in terms of the overall market itself, what are some of the shifts that you have seen as somebody who's working within that market and the types of things that businesses are asking for from their business intelligence suite and the types of data that they're dealing with? I think that there are three things I've noticed. One is the fact that there is more data that organizations have. So, and that makes tools that work with extracts like Tableau or Power BI a bit obsolete. Now we have really powerful data warehouses or even data lakes like Athena or Spark and stuff like that. And really, you, you want the raw power of these tools and not something to, to put on top of them. So that's one trend that really helped Redish is the fact that people have these massive data sets that they want to analyze using their databases. The other one is the rise of open source. I don't think, like, there, there have been some open source solutions in the past, but I don't think that any of them was, like, really an open source, as in, like, having a big community and stuff like that. And that's something quite new. Like, you mentioned Metabase and Superset. They're probably, like, the biggest examples aside from Redash. And I, but none of us are still at the size of the commercial solutions. And, and that will change. That will change. I think that in the future, we will see the open source solutions becoming as massive, if not more, as the commercial solutions. And then interesting things will happen. Um, another thing that I'm noticing is that more companies want to use data um, like to expose data to their customers, like basically embedded analytics use cases. Uh, we see more and more people ask about that. And then beyond just the different data sources that are supported, the other core element of Redash is actually visualizing the results of the queries that are being executed. You know, you can just use the tabular results and be able to parse through that visually, but the primary ways that I've used it and that I've seen others use it is by actually creating these visualizations and combining them into a dashboard to try and tell an overall story of the data so that it's accessible to those business users who don't necessarily want to dive into the SQL queries or whatever the particular syntax is. And I'm curious how you support users in choosing effective visualizations for the answers that they're trying to provide and the context that they're trying to create for those different dashboards. Um, so unfortunately, I can't say that we are doing too great job in like helping the user choose an effective way to, to show their data. We have a few experiments 
things like our funnel visualization, where we basically, you provide us with funnel data and we show it in a meaningful way. Like it's a bit beyond of like just letting you define the visualization. It has some presets of its own. But aside from that, like most of our visualizations, we try just to give you the options you might need to create effective visualizations, but we don't really help you with that. I recently picked up a few books, books on the topic actually, uh, by, by Stephen Few and started like just exploring that more of like what it really means to create meaningful visualizations, like things that not just look good, but actually communicate the data better. And I hope that we would start providing better guidance in this area, but it will take time. And in terms of the challenges in communicating with those visualizations, what do you see as being some of the common stumbling blocks that your users and customers encounter when they are trying to build these dashboards and use Redash as a communication tool? One thing that is not unique to Redash is basically knowing what the question to ask and what data to look at. But on top of that, there is also some challenge sometimes of really knowing your data base schema and like different like issues that you might have in your data. Like sometimes you might create a query that shows the data you want, but apparently if you dig into it, you realize that you have something that you need to clean up or exclude, like, I don't know, test users or whatever. A another challenge that is actually is a bit unique to Redish is the fact that you need to know the query language of your database. And sometimes it might seem that SQL is, doesn't let you answer the question you want, but actually SQL is quite powerful, so there is usually a solution. Um, it might be tricky, but I guess that's the kind of challenges you sometimes see. And then the other element of communicating with data in the context of Redash is the ability for people who are familiar with the query language and also people who are using the output of that to be able to collaborate on asking and answering the different questions. And I'm curious what your approach is to that challenge in Redash or what you have seen as being effective patterns for people who are leveraging Redash for trying to fulfill those goals. Yeah, that, that's a great one. I mean, our like collaboration around data is something that's really been on my mind when I started with Redash. It's actually reflected in our logo. It's like a speech bubble and the sort of chart, which basically is supposed to communicate collaboration and data. And obviously, we still have a way to go here, but something that really helps is the fact that you have the query itself next to the data that you're looking at. So that allows others who look at what you're doing like to, to really understand how you got the results that you got. And then if they want to explore it further, they can like fork, fork your query and like dig further. We, we are going to expand the collaboration features we have. It's probably going to start with allowing collaboration on the same query. And that's basically very easy to enable. It's like just change some logic. But I think that to make it effective, we need to make sure that we have good versioning of the queries or the other objects that you can edit in Redash. Um, and then commenting and stuff like that. But it takes time. There is a, we have lots of things to do. And so digging deeper into the platform itself, can you describe how Redash itself is implemented and some of the overall design and architecture changes that have happened since you first began working on it? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically something that I try to follow is to use boring technologies and that basically both to make it easy for people to maintain, like those people who deploy Redash for their usage, to make it easy for them um, to maintain it and to support it. So we try to use things that they probably will be familiar with them. And the other side of that is that if people want to contribute to our code base, they will probably find technologies and patterns they are very familiar with. We basically use Python for the backend, which uses Flask, SQL Alchemy, and then Redis and Postgres to support that. And we were also using Celery, but we are actually switching to RQ now. But it's actually this practically, it's not really an architecture change. It's just swapping a library. So our architecture was quite stable for the past, I think, three years at least. Um, at the beginning, I experimented with various stuff, like I used Think Tornado and actually Django ORM at some point. But in the past three or so years, there were no big changes in terms of like what the kind of tools we use. Another big part of the code base is our front end. And there we started with AngularJS six years ago. And about a year ago, 
we started the transition from Angular to React. Um, we were trying to decide between React and Vue.js, but we picked React mainly because there was a really nice way to keep working um, of having like a dual of hybrid code base where we have both AngularJS code and React code side by side. And that's what we've been releasing for the past year. Um, basically with every release, there were more code that was in React. And now we are really, really close to the finish line. Like practically all is left is to switch the router and we are re Angular free. So that's, that's nice. And because of the fact that Redash was born out of a hackathon, it seems somewhat obvious that Python would be the language that you chose for implementing it as a way of just being able to get something done quickly. But I'm curious if you were to start over today, if there were any design elements or foundational pieces of the code that you would do differently, either choosing different languages or different frameworks or just overall different system architecture. That's an interesting one. I might choose to use Node for the backend just so that we have a single language in our code base it's sometimes like you start putting semicolons in your python code when you switch too much and node has the benefit of being asynchronous which is really helpful when what you're doing most of the time is io now obviously python has some as async support today but it's very different when you have some libraries that support asynchronous code and some not where in Node, it's all asynchronous, but I really like Python, so I'm not sure I would really do something different in that sense today. Yeah, I think that Redash has also benefited from being in Python because of the fact that there are so many different libraries to support the various data sources that you're working with. And that I think you'd be hard pressed to find that same level of support in other ecosystems, though Node might be a close competitor in that regard. Yeah, that, that, that for sure. Although... Like uh, the, the the like we have I think a bit over forty types of data sources supported today, but I think something like ten of them are mostly used, and the rest is like a long tail. So I'm not sure. Like if that was the only reason, I'm not sure it's a big reason to choose Python over Node. You can always like start another process and just delegate to it, and it can be written in any language. But I don't know. Like I find like the libraries and the tools nicer on the Python side. And then in terms of the system design of how it's implemented and how the queries are executed, I'm curious what you have seen as far as challenges, particularly when it comes to people trying to execute queries that are returning large volumes of data and being able to represent that back on the front end or being able to handle the data in the query execution. Yeah, so that's something that we don't really handle really well. And that's almost, like, it's not intentional. Like, in, in hindsight, I might implement it differently. Um, and then it would be, easy, like, it would be probably easier to implement it from the get-go differently than now trying to redo. But we definitely don't support large data sets well. But considering the use cases really she used for, it's not a big issue because... Most of the time, the data you're going to visualize is not going to be big because there is no like there is no point in having lots of data points when you create a visualization. Like people don't see in this fidelity. Um, and if a person is going to look at the results, they're also not going to review lots of results. People do want larger data sets usually when they're trying to connect Redash with some other system like use Redish as an API, or when they want to download the data set and crunch it in Excel. So yeah, we don't really support large data sets, result sets really well. Like you, you can basically just give Redish more memory and then it will be fine. But the main issue is the fact that we load everything into memory, then convert it to JSON, and only then dump it into our local cache. I mean, that, that's not super great. Yeah, but as you said, the use case that Redash is designed for isn't really one where you want to be processing large volumes of data because you want your queries to be structured in a way that they're actually going to condense the information down into something that's digestible by somebody who's trying to gain some insight from that information rather than just say, here is all of the data for this query of you know 10 million rows. <laughs> Yeah, although one thing that happened over time is for a long time, my message was use your database to crunch your data and use Redish to visualize it. And basically, we, we don't store your data. We don't like we, we just visualize it. But what happened is that I'm, I'm not sure when exactly it was, but a few years back, I, we introduced the query results feature, basically the ability to run queries on top of it other query results. And 
the idea here was to like allow different use cases of where you might want to join data between different data sources, or sometimes it's a bit easier to run some query, like another computation of, on top of existing query results or whatever. But people are very creative and people tend to abuse the tools you give them. But obviously you need to be mindful of that. And like, it, it's good when people abuse your product. It means that it brings them value and you just need to like look at what they do and try to like give them a better solution. And basically, once we gave this feature, people started using Reader sometimes as a form of database. And then they want to have ability to like load larger result sets into Redash. Um, and that's something that I've been looking into recently and like trying to figure out what we can do better there. Yeah, it's definitely interesting the ways that people will work around the sharp edges of a tool and make it do things that it was never actually intended to do just because it's the tool that they have rather than seeking outside and looking for the tool that's more well suited to the particular problem that they have because it's only 5% of their use case and the other 95% is filled by the tool that they have. Yep. Beyond just the open source code base of Redash, there's the business that you've built around it. And so I'm curious what you have seen as the sort of benefits of having a hosted solution in terms of the adoption of the product and how you balance the needs of the business against the desires and needs of the open source community that are using and contributing to Redash. Yeah, so having a hosted solution really helps because when you have an open source product, it's really hard to know what people use it for and in what ways. So having a, a hosted solution really gives us a way to look into like how people use it, what kind of visualizations they use, what kind of data sources are they use. And obviously, it's not um, a perfect representation of how the general population uses Redish, but it definitely gives you some idea of what's more common and what's less. You need to be mindful because like, for example, we support IBM DB2 or whatever, and like that's less common to be used in a cloud um, environment, I guess. So you won't see that on the SaaS, but there might be people who use it with the open source version, but it's still like you get so much visibility on how people might use the product. And whenever we like, Whenever we make a release, it's always after a significant time when we had that code base running on SaaS and we stumbled at like different stupid bugs and mistakes. So it helps us make more stable releases because like it's, it's harder for people to upgrade often. So we try to make sure that when we make a release, it's worth, the, worth of their time to, to upgrade. And that's an interesting point, too, is because you have this hosted platform, my guess is that you're deploying the current state of the master branch. And I'm wondering what your decision points are as far as when to say that this particular point of the code is a major release that one of the open source users is going to deploy as an artifact versus people who want to just deploy straight from master themselves. So it's usually a combination of, okay, enough time passed since the previous release, and there is enough interesting stuff in this release for people to upgrade. Um, I was hoping to have regular releases every month, but it just so happens that it's really, it's really hard for us to, to maintain that schedule. So it's usually, I think, a release every three, four months. And so basically when we feel, okay, we have enough stuff there that it's worth upgrading, and it feels that it's stable enough. Like we had this conversion running for quite some time. Nothing major came up. We make a better release. And then after the better release, basically that helps with whoever, like um, all the early adopters who might deploy it on-prem and then find out issues that we don't experience on the SaaS version. We then make another round of fixes and we make uh, the final release. The other thing that I'm interested on the business side is the overall business model that you have and some of the ways that it has grown or evolved since you first started the company and just your overall lessons learned in terms of managing the business behind the product. Yeah, so when I started, I researched into like how people basically, what are the business models that people use for open source projects? And what I learned is basically people are doing everything and the bigger companies definitely do like all the stuff um, like support, SaaS, different versions and all this stuff. But I took 
inspiration from what Sentry been doing, which is basically a SaaS offering of the same code base you have on, on, on the open source side, which I really like because it's like very simple. There is no conflict of interest. And I figured, yeah, let's do that. Now, because uh, I'm bootstrapping and I really like really quickly burned all my savings on that experience and SaaS takes time to, to ramp up. I, I was hustling for like any stream of income at the beginning. So we do have a few companies that pay us for support. Like that, that's the bigger users that reached out and really wanted like someone to be able to answer their questions when they need to. And at the beginning, it felt that, wow, like SaaS is such a bad, such a terrible um, business model and support is so much better because we were making so much more money from support and that's like from four customers versus the SaaS platform. But lucky enough, I was patient to wait. And today, SaaS makes most of our revenues, like uh, something like over 90% of our revenues is coming from SaaS. And I definitely see the benefits. Like it's a very stable in a way business model. Um, like especially when, when you deal with lots of small customers versus the big ones. So that was nice. Every year I've been telling myself, yeah, this year we're going to introduce some offering for for the enterprise users because basically all, all the big companies that use Redash, they use the open source version. And they use that not because they want to save money or anything. They just use the open source version because they're not going to trust some SaaS vendor um, with their database. So it made sense to offer them something they can pay for, which isn't support, because support is not, like I, I want to be a software company and I want to sell software, I don't want to sell support. Um, I want to make my product easy to use, like that people don't really need support. So every year I've been telling, okay, this year we're gonna introduce something for the bigger customers that deploy on-prem. And every year it was pushed back because we were so busy with like building the product itself, uh, working on the SaaS stuff. And over time, I think that what happened is that the world changed a bit. Like more and more companies are more comfortable with SaaS offering. Now, obviously, I don't know, like uh, Bank of America will not adopt uh, a SaaS offering anytime soon, but that's fine. Like I don't really need to serve all the customers in the world. So, and, and more and more companies are definitely willing to use a SaaS offering, even for things like their database access. So I, I think I'm not sure if we will ever have some kind of an enterprise offering. But on the other hand, you never know. It's definitely good that you held out with the SaaS approach because as you, as you said, you can scale it much more readily and you're much less susceptible to customer churn if somebody drops off versus if you have a smaller number of support contracts where you're gaining more revenue per customer but if one of them then decides to go with a different solution or they go out of business or whatever the reason is that they no longer maintain that support contract it's a much bigger hit to you and then you have to scramble to try and find somebody to replace them and i would imagine too that by having that direct support contract it's a much bigger burden of time on your end versus somebody who comes and signs up for the SaaS platform and then they just use the aggregate support network that you have built around on that product so to be honest and i hope that none of our support customers is listening the support contract's been great <laughs> i mean they don't reach out that much and usually their questions are very reasonable but i don't think that scales like if we were try if we try to scale that eventually like we would need to scale people instead of servers to handle the load well sometimes people would like support just for like the, their peace of mind <laughs> of knowing, hey, if we ever have a question, someone can answer us. But it's sometimes needed because the product isn't easy enough and I don't want to be there. Like I want to make it super easy. Like if today you want to deploy Redash, you go to our website, click Get Things Started, go to our setup page. There are links to like the popular clouds like AWS, Google, um, DigitalOcean. We should probably add support for Azure. And a few minutes later, you have Redash running. That, that, that's something that we might not want to have if we were like building our business around support and people having to reach out to us and stuff like that. I don't want to be in, to have this conflict. And yeah, that, that, that's definitely a good point is 
if your business is built around support, then you end up making it harder to actually use the open source product, which is never going to benefit anybody because it will just create a conflict between you and your users, whereas you want it to be as friction free to help adoption so that if somebody comes in on the open source channel and then decides that they don't want to actually be in the business of running their own server, they can just easily switch over to the SaaS platform. So yeah, I definitely appreciate your clarity on that point. <laughs> yep. In terms of the uses of the platform, you mentioned that you've seen some people abusing it for various cases. I'm curious what you have seen as some of the most interesting or innovative or, or unexpected ways that people are leveraging Redash. Um, so people are a bit shy on sharing how they use Redash. So I, I don't really have a good visibility on that, but I do hear stories from time to time. I think the one that I'm most proud about is an organization that does cancer readish and uses readish to support their efforts. That's awesome. I really hope they are successful in whatever they do. And I guess the most unexpected usage is the French Navy. Like the, the, their, um, the people that do sea rescues, they use Redash to like analyze their efforts. And that's really unexpected. And then when is Redash the wrong platform to use and somebody would be better suited by going with a different solution? Um, so right now, he, the first thing is when you don't have anyone in the organization who knows SQL or whatever the query language your database uses. Um, it doesn't have to be SQL. Most of the time it is. So if, if there is no such person in your organization, then yeah, Redish is not a good fit. It doesn't mean that everybody needs to know SQL to benefit from Redish, but there has to be at least a single person. Another case is when you want to support self-service and then you might want to choose Looker and invest in like defining your data models and stuff like that. But you need to be really honest with yourself and make sure that you really need that full um, self-service BI thing. Um, because many times there are still people who create the reports and in that case you could just go with Redash. I guess that another case is when people are trying to use Redash as some sort of an admin tool. And that in that case there would be like we do that actually ourselves um, because it's very easy for us. It's already connected to the database, so we can create different views when like for our support use cases. But eventually, if you really need an admin tool, you will be better served with a full like CRUD tool, like Retool or Forest Admin and stuff like that. Also, people sometimes use Redash for um, operations, like infrastructure stuff. Sometimes Redash can be a good solution there. We, again, we use Redash for that as well, but we are a bit biased. Um, but I guess that for these use cases, Grafana would probably be a better solution, especially if you connect it with some time series database that they support. And for the future of Redash, what do you have planned both in terms of the business and the open source project? So I, I try not to make commitments because life is surprising. Um, right now we are focused on finishing the two big efforts of like migrating um, to Python 3 and RQ on the back end. So that like, takes our focus to make sure that we deliver a stable version on that end. And then on the front end side to finish with the React migration. Once that's done, we'll be finally free to get to really dig into developing some stuff that's been waiting for a long time. We actually did deliver some new features this year, but mostly we've been focused on the React migration. I guess that when, when we like come back from that effort, or just have to review like the, the kind of feedback we have and try to assess what's really the next thing. There are some interesting stuff that we really want to really want to experiment with and to deliver. Um, but I really try not to make commitments because uh, you can see that in our GitHub tracker where like we have this make email reports from six years ago and people like, hey, when's that gonna be available? So I kind of learned to. Let's commit to stuff that we're actually working on. All right. Well, are there any other aspects of the Redash product or the business you've built around it or the overall business intelligence market that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a big one. No, I don't know. Like we covered lots of stuff. If you have any questions, I'm happy to keep discussing stuff. Otherwise, I'm good. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with you and follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And so with that, 
I'll move us into the picks. And because we've been talking about a lot of things having to do with business intelligence and data and managing it, I'm going to pick my other show, the Data Engineering Podcast. So you can listen to interviews about a number of the different projects and tools and topics that we've been talking about here in a little bit greater depth. So I'll uh, plug that again. So with that, I'll move pass it to you, Eric. Do you have any picks this week? Yeah. So one pick is Peewee. It's like P. Double E W W E. Um, it's a Python ORM that we were using before we switched to SQL Alchemy, and it's probably one of the decisions that I regret the most. I wish we stayed with Peewee. I think it's like the most Pythonic ORM there is. It's really great engineering, super easy to use, and I miss it. Another one is Amazon ECS. Um, everybody seems to use either serverless or Kubernetes these days, but ECS is sometimes overlooked, but it's really matured a lot in the past years and it makes it very easy to have a very resilient infrastructure and it really helps us sleep better at night. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and discuss your experience of building and managing the Redash project and the business that you've built on top of it. Uh, it's definitely a useful tool that I have been using for a while. So I appreciate all of your efforts on that front and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Sure. You too. Have a great day and thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out our other show, The Data Engineering Podcast, at dataengineeringpodcast.com for the latest on modern data management. And visit the site at pythonpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at podcastinit.com with your story. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends and coworkers.